We have Tony Nguyen, thanks Tony, Victor Trumper, Adrian George, oh, lots of people joining us today, Mark Bondietti. We've got a nice range of people from all around Australia, looks like. David Green from Arb Group, Hugh Dixon. We've got lots of people joining us from all around Australia. So thank you so much for sending those through. Without further ado, we'll commence our presentation today. So I'm just going to unmute our presenters and let them get on with Just one second while I do that. All righty. David and Good Morris, are you everyone. there? Yes, we're here. Thank you very much for that introduction, Angela. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started and talk about um, managed motorways. So the purpose of this webinar is to try and explain what a managed motorway is, uh, what traffic management tools are used on managed motorways, what are the benefits of these tools and the overall system of managed motorways. And throughout this discussion, we'll talk about motorways, but we'll probably interchange that word with freeways quite a lot, uh, which is really the same as expressways, but we don't actually use the word expressways very often. So motorway and freeway, we mean the same thing. Um, so let's start with freeway congestion. Um, in the past, we've had the luxury of freeways with spare capacity and being able to widen freeways to accommodate increasing flows. Um, but now um, it's much more difficult to widen freeways, more expensive to widen freeways, more limitations on the options of actually using the land for more freeways. And, um, and there's a lot of congestion costs in the community, about $20 billion per annum of avoidable congestion costs by the year 2020 um, in all the Australian capital cities. So congested freeways are a major part of, uh, of this problem of congestion on our roads. So a few things about freeway congestion. Um, on urban freeways with significant periods of congestion, approximately 75% of that congestion is not actually related to incidents. Maybe about 25% related to incidents and 75% related to recurrent congestion that happens every day. And congested freeways are generally operating under capacity. Um, if we can uh, relieve the congestion, we can actually increase the capacity of the roads. By efficiently managing traffic flow with ramp signals, it's possible to alleviate congestion and achieve about 20% um, of additional throughput on our freeways. So what are managed freeways? So managed freeways actively apply the following things. Uh, contemporary traffic theory, because traffic theory has actually changed a bit in recent times. Um, with, a, with an emphasis on congestion and how to alleviate it. New analysis and design standards to facilitate efficient operations, so designing the entry ramps uh, and the main line and the exit ramps, all in order to, um, to maximise the usage of the facility. And a managed freeway will, uh, will actively apply state-of-the-art control algorithms, so a lot of intelligence is put into the managed freeway systems. New applications of intelligent transport systems or ITS and communications technology and integration of control systems because there are many elements to manage freeways and the integration of those elements is very important. So some of the tools that are used on managed freeways is coordinated ramp metering. So there's a picture of a ramp meter in, in action in Melbourne. Um, that's not actually in action because the lights aren't on. Um, but uh, that's probably the most important part of managed freeway technology. Lane use management systems in which we have um, uh, signs over each lane to indicate speed limits and which lanes are open or closed. Variable speed limit signs. Traveller information which can be provided on the main line using uh, variable message signs such as this one or other message signs which are electronic on the arterial roads leading to the freeway. Closed circuit TV is an important component so that operators can actually see what's happening on the, on the road. And incident detection systems and incident management systems are also an important part of the managed freeway. 
So the objectives of managed freeways are to provide a resilient freeway for road users that maximises safety, optimises throughput, optimises travel time, maximises travel time reliability so there's less variation in travel time from one day to the next. Um, now I'd just like to get into a bit of um, fundamental um, traffic theory which um, some of you might have done at university. Uh, or you may remember or you may not remember, but let's do a bit of revision on, uh, on basic traffic flow theory for roads that have uninterrupted flow, um, uh, of which a freeway is, is the classic example. So these um, three diagrams indicate um, uh, traditional traffic flow theory. The first and most important one probably is the speed versus flow diagram, which has this sort of shape here. Um, if uh, traffic is very light, then it will operate at free flow. This VF value is free flow speed, normally 100 kilometres an hour if that's the speed limit of the freeway. But as uh, uh, flow increases, as more traffic tries to use the freeway, the speed will reduce a little bit because there's more interaction between the vehicles. And then you get to a point here which is the capacity, the maximum flow that can be achieved on the road. So what's this bit down the bottom? This bit down the bottom is often called force flow or flow breakdown where traffic is travelling um, very slowly um, and often in stop-start conditions. Um, but the important thing about this bottom part of the graph is that the actual flow rate is reduced. This graph here is speed versus density. Um, so again, this point up here is where there's very little flow, low density, and the speeds are high at free flow and then degrades to high density and force flow down the bottom here. The other graph is flow versus density uh, which has this shape and again down the bottom here you have low density and low flow at high speeds. Up here you have capacity and down here you have force flow conditions, high density, low flow and stop start conditions, low average speeds. So the point is that um, when congestion occurs, the, um, those graphs are operating in, in those areas indicated by red. What we really want the freeway to operate at is at um, optimum density and optimum traffic flow. So it's important also to understand those fundamental concepts. Speed, um, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, is kilometres per hour, so the um, distance travelled per unit of time. Flow is the number of vehicles per hour passing a given point on a road or, or lane. Uh, density is the number of vehicles per kilometre. So density is less apparent to people, um, and the best way to think about density is that uh, if you're in a helicopter and took a picture of the freeway, um, count up the number of cars per kilometre, that's an indication of density. But unless you're in a helicopter, it's actually very difficult to see and measure density. So what's often used is another um, uh, parameter called occupancy, which is uh, used as a surrogate for density in the control systems because it's a lot easier to measure. And it's measured by having detectors in the roadway and uh, measuring the proportion of time that those detectors are occupied by a vehicle over the detector. So instead of being expressed in vehicles per kilometre, it's usually expressed as a percentage. And the, the equivalence between density and occupancy can differ depending on the detector size. Now, yeah, pass over to Morris. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, we're now going to be looking at uh, a bit more background to do with traffic flow on motorways and freeways, as, for, as well as an overview on various uh, traffic management um, tools which can be used. So freeway capacity, let's look at that a bit more closely. The definition from the Highway Capacity Manual is the maximum sustainable ALE flow rate at which vehicles reasonably can be expected to traverse a point or uniform segment of a lane or roadway during a given time period under prevailing roadway, environmental, traffic and control conditions. And the Highway Capacity Manual would indicates that under ideal conditions for basic freeway segments, uh, at 100 kilometres per hour, 2,300 passenger cars per hour per lane would be the capacity. Now, under ideal conditions, what that means is essentially level and straight, multi-lane divided road with full access control, only passenger cars, no influence from opposing flows, and three and a half metre lanes with uh, minimum 1.8 lateral clearances. 
Now, as these things um, change, they affect capacity. And so the reality in real life is that the capacity is uh, significantly less than 2,300 passenger cars per hour per lane. This is some research done um, for the Horror Capacity Manual prior to that in 2009. And it was done on US uh, freeways from a database consisting of 48 basic freeway sites over nine states. And this is in the shape of one of the fundamental diagrams where we have speed on the vertical axis and flow on the horizontal. And the red line here indicates the curve which you'd find in the Highway Capacity Manual um, with a capacity of 2,300 passenger cars per hour per lane. What the data found in, in that uh, fairly uh, extensive st study was that the maximum flow achieved was only about 2,100. Uh, the flow breakdown occurred at about 1,900 passenger cars per hour per lane and then after that congested flow was uh, 1,700 uh, and less. Um, freeway system capacity is affected by segments and influence areas which uh, could be grades, tight curves or narrow sections, merge areas, diverge areas and weaving areas. So based on experience from Australia's urban freeways and some international design guidelines, some realistic capacity values for design uh, for an unmanaged freeway, um, about 1,800 passenger cars per hour per lane, and for managed freeways, uh, 2,100 passenger cars per hour per lane. And of course, when I talk about a managed freeway there, I, I talk about a, a freeway with uh, a state-of-the-art coordinated ramp metering system where values can be sustained throughout the peak period and not just reached for a short time prior to flow breakdown. So let's look at flow breakdown a bit more closely. This is the condition where free flowing traffic experiences significant and sudden reduction in speed with a sustained loss of throughput. Here's a, uh, another graph which again has speed on the vertical axis with flow horizontal and this shows um, the, uh, some data on, from the Monash Freeway in Melbourne where it was upstream of an entry ramp uh, coming into the main line and uh, you can see how the different lanes were affected, how flow breakdown occurred and uh, how congestion set in as, uh, as that happened. Uh, the um, Highway Capacity Manual talks about two traffic phases. The first is before flow day breakdown, which is levels of service A to level of service E. Then after flow breakdown, which is forced flow, which is level of service F. There's minimal information in the Highway Capacity Manual relating to the mechanisms of flow breakdown or of flow recovery. Now we're going to look at how fast um, flow breakdown can actually occur. So these are some photographs taken uh, a few years ago um, on the Monash Freeway in Melbourne where it, it can demonstrate uh, how fast um, flow breakdown can happen. And these photographs are taken about one minute apart. That was at 2.59, then at 3 o'clock, and at 3.01, 3.02, 3.03, so over a period of about um, five or six minutes, uh, the freeway went from free-flowing uh, conditions almost to uh, a situation where flow breakdown occurred, where significant congestion and delays had set in. So the probability of flow breakdown is, is a very interesting um, uh, topic where, where it shows that flow breakdown is probabilistic rather than a deterministic event. And uh, this study that was done in Perth on the Mitchell Freeway shows that, um, that the, the probability of flow breakdown happening at different flows. Uh, here we've got uh, probability on the vertical axis with um, the, the flow rates horizontally. And, and this study was carried out by looking at the, the flow just prior to flow breakdown over several several uh, uh, periods of time. 
And, and what it showed was um, that the probability of flow breakdown at about 1,700 vehicles per hour per lane was about 10%. At 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane, which is a figure we often use as a typical flow on a freeway, there's a, it showed that there's an 85 per cent probability of flow breakdown in an unmanaged freeway setting in at that value. And these sort of uh, results are very similar to results from uh, Brillon in Germany that, uh, from a study he undertook in 2005. This is an example of the same stretch of freeway in Melbourne where, in 2004 where uh, the top line shows flow without flow breakdown and then the bottom showed the flow uh, with flow breakdown which was uh, just a, a week or two later. And uh, what actually um, happened on, through this period of time is that sometimes flow would break down uh, one day and yet it wouldn't on another day for no apparent reason and it's understanding this probability uh, factor which um, uh, which has led us to understand this uh, this phenomenon a bit better. Uh, what happens of course there is that uh, where, when, uh, when flow breakdown does occur there's lost productivity of 25% uh, or so and, um, and then um, if this becomes a regular event, well obviously uh, you're going to be missing out on uh, capacity of that facility over an extended period of time. Here's another example of some data, uh, firstly of an unmanaged freeway, and this chart is, is also in the shape of one of the fundamental diagrams which has flow on the vertical axis and ho occupancy horizontally. And you can see that as, um, as flow increased, uh, obviously the traffic got more dense over that period and started to affect uh, speeds as well until it reached the point where at optimum uh, it was probably carrying the, uh, the closest it could to capacity flow. Then flow breakdown occurred and then for the rest of the peak period uh, there was congestion and uh, reduced throughput, reduced speed and uh, lost productivity. This, um, this value of capacity was only reached for a relatively short time. Um, on the, in a managed freeway, managed with uh, coordinated ramp signals, you can see that uh, flow can be prevented where flows increased, demand increased to the, to, in a similar manner, but when it reached the optimum, the ramp signals were, were able to maintain flow at that uh, optimum or near optimum uh, condition. During that, during, during that time, uh, flow breakdown was prevented. Uh, there was optimum throughput and speed and automated flow recovery. The little loop in the data here would, would have been a, a situation where a spike in the data could have caused flow breakdown, but the coordinated ramp signals were able to recover the, the flow and to, to keep the flow operating at optimum. So, um, along a freeway or motorway section, the critical segment or bottleneck is the segment that will break down first as flows increase and that becomes a, a very important point to focus on in, in managing freeway flow. Upstream ramps are metered to prevent or minimise flow breakdown. So the critical bottleneck along the route determines the overall system capacity and flows need to be managed within the main line. Uh, to, within that capacity. So the principal actions of ramp metering are firstly headway management. Uh, this disperses uh, platoons or bunching of traffic coming from an interchange through traffic signals for, for example and provide an even flow of traffic into the merge. The second action is that uh, the signals manage the rate of entering flow at the ramp merge when the freeway is near capacity and maintains that uh, flow close to the uh, level of capacity at that bottleneck. And uh, thirdly, coordinating traffic from a number of ramps to ensure the main line densities are within downstream bottleneck capacities. And with this operation, the algorithm needs to balance queues between ramps 
to manage queue lengths within the ramp storages available and to balance waiting times. So realistically, ramp metering uh, does have some limitations. It's not a cure-all for all freeway congestion. Uh, excessive demand will present uh, occupation, operational problems, even with the best coordinated ramp signal operation, and uncontrolled demand at some uh, entry ramps into the system would also be a, a, a lack of um, a control. Some freeway problems may require additional capacity or upgrading to address bottleneck problems. Obviously, if you've got major issues associated with uh, the infrastructure, uh, ramp metering may not be able to fully uh, address uh, the problems relating to, to those. But uh, ramp metering has proven to be an extremely cost-effective strategy in preventing and reducing congestion. We'll now start to look at uh, some of the benefits of uh, ramp metering. And uh, we're going to have a poll question now. What is the likelihood of crashes on a congested freeway compared to a free running freeway? Do you think it's 1.6 times, 2.4 times, 4.5 times, or 6 times? So Great question, Morris. Vote now. We've opened the poll, so we're just waiting on a few more votes to come in before we close that off. If everyone can just get their responses in over the next few seconds. We have 73% have voted, which is fantastic. Just waiting on a few more now. Okay. Closing the poll off now. Thank you, everyone, that responded. And I'm just going to share those results with you. Now, David and Morris, can you see those results? Yes. Yeah. So... I feel like evenly split. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think of those results? Do they speak to you? What do they say to you? Well, I think uh, the general feeling is that there is uh, significant uh, safety benefits in keeping the freeway running, which is why ramp signals uh, can be so effective in terms of producing benefits for, for flow. But the answer is, um, is uh, six times from research done in the Queensland University of Te Technology, which uh, showed that the likelihood of crashes on a congested freeway is six times the likelihood on a free running freeway. Goodness me. All righty. Okay, I've closed that for you now, so you can continue with your presentation. Now I'll move to some of the other benefits of ramp signals. Um, I'll mention safety again. The, the re reduced freeway delays, uh, this is one of the a significant uh, benefit, and some of this data I'm quoting now comes from uh, a US white paper on uh, a state of the practice uh, relating to managed freeway um, traffic management interventions. Uh, reduced freeway delays where mainline speed can increase from 8 to 60 percent. Uh, better mainline operation uh, more than offsets the ramp delays. Uh, there's reduced mainline traffic crashes and their consequences where to reductions in total crashes from 15 to 50 percent. Increased freeway throughput at critical times and locations from 8 to 22 uh, percent. Ramp signals also assist in traffic uh, in weaving areas because they manage the headways and can um, minimise turbulence. And ramp signals also minimise lane change in the vicinity of an entry ramp because some drivers avoid left lane delays and the bunching of entering traffic when there's no metering. Now we're going to look at uh, a number of other traffic management tools which may be uh, considered uh, for a managed motorway. Firstly, the use of emergency stopping lanes. This uh, can maximise available road space through utilisation of that uh, shoulder area. Uh, this could be either full-time or part-time during high demand and provide additional capacity for mainline traffic with minimal change to infrastructure. 
managing exit ramp traffic may need to be considered uh, at some locations where high entry flows or inadequate uh, ramps or interchange capacity might cause vehicles to queue out onto the main line. This of course would affect the main line flow, uh, create turbulence, reduce capacity as well. So sometimes there's simple solutions for this, other times uh, you might need to consider increasing capacity of the ramp or interchange. Now I might hand back to David now who will talk about some further aspects of, uh, of managed motorways. Okay, so as well as um, coordinated ramp signals, one of the other things we like to do is to manage incidents. Um, this is probably a technique that's been used on a lot of, uh, of freeways uh, up to now, but it's certainly part of the package of managed motorways. So the incidents might be caused by disabled vehicles or by crashes or loss of load or some sort of debris on the road. Um, it could be an emergency such as severe adverse weather, or water on the road or some sort of natural disaster. Um, or it could be caused by unplanned maintenance activities. So whatever the cause, the objective is to manage incidents to return the motorway to full productivity as soon as possible. Um, so this is a graph showing um, uh, cumulative arrivals and departures um, on a stretch of freeway and the horizontal axis is time. So the, the line going straight through here would be arrivals equals departures, so everyone's just getting through as you arrive, you depart, you arrive in this segment of freeway, you get through the freeway without any trouble. But if there's an incident, as indicated here, um, then it might take some time for the incident to be detected. And then it takes some time for the incident to be removed, and then it takes some time for the traffic to return to normal. So there's three main components, the time to detect the incident and respond to it, um, the time to clear the incident, and then the time for traffic to return to normal. And if traffic volumes are fairly high at the time of an incident, then this area here, after the incident has been removed, can actually be quite long in order to clear the uh, residual queues. So managing incidents has really got four components. Firstly, early detection and verification, which can be achieved using some sort of automatic incident detection system. Uh, maybe the help telephones along the freeway can help to, uh, to uh, alert the traffic management centre that there's an incident. Closed circuit TV is also very uh, valuable, probably more valuable in terms of verifying the incident rather than actually detecting it. Then the second is efficient response to the uh, attending the incident site, making sure that the response teams can get there quickly and emergency services can get there quickly. And then the third is effectively managing the incident um, uh, during the, the, when the, the, all the uh, response teams are there. So the response teams and the emergency services obviously have got things that they have to do um, and if there are serious injuries or fatalities then there are reports that they have to write and investigations they have to do um, but um, uh, the objective should be to try and open the freeway within those constraints as soon as possible. And then there are actions to reduce the freeway demand. So during all of this, if something can be done to reduce the amount of traffic coming onto the freeway, then that can help to, uh, to reopen the freeway to um, uh, normal conditions quicker. Either by closing freeway ramps, which might be a fairly severe uh, case, but sometimes necessary, um, or at least by providing traveller information so that drivers can make their choice to, um, to avoid the congested area. And therefore the objective is, going back to this graph again, to just reduce this amount of red time, which is all the, all the uh, queued vehicles within the incident site, by reducing the, uh, the detection time, the time to remove, and by implementing as possible some traffic using alternative routes to reduce this sort of tail of the, um, of the residual queues. Now let's talk about land use management systems, or sometimes LUMS for short. Um, so this is, these are systems of um, lane control signals and variable speed limit signs um, on the freeways. Uh, the lane control signals are over each individual lane within a tunnel. It is usually done this way with um, either red crosses or arrows above each lane and speed limit signs at the side. And on the mainline freeway it's more commonly done this way. Uh, with the speed limit signs over each lane as well. 
So there's a picture of implementation of um, LUM signs uh, which have the variable speed limits integrated into them and the speed limit sign not only tells you what the speed limit is but also indicates that the lane is open to traffic. So in an incident situation where a lane needs to be closed for some reason or might even be planned roadworks, ideally you might have an, a variable message sign in advance along the freeway where you can advise drivers what's happening downstream and then on a gantry you would indicate an inclined arrow to tell drivers to merge to their right um, and then on subsequent gantries you would have a red cross to indicate that the lane is closed and then after that you might reopen the freeway by putting the speed limit sign back on over that lane where it's uh, reopened to traffic. So the capabilities of the LUM signs. Um, during incident management they improve safety by warning drivers of downstream lane closures and the need to change lanes and improve safety during through the actual incident area by, uh, by having those lane closures. Uh, provi providing access for emergency vehicles. Often it's difficult for emergency vehicles to get through the congested traffic to the incident, so by closing lanes and leaving them available for emergency vehicles, that can be a huge advantage. And managing the speeds to improve the safety and stability of traffic flow. So managing lane closures during roadworks or events uh, protects and improves safety of the works area. Um, it rapidly uh, implements lane closures and uh, can rapidly reopen the lane closures. The other option, of course, is um, to get workmen out there with signs and cones and bollards, um, which is quite effective but takes quite a time to implement. And again, the LUM signs have the speed limits in them, so that can manage the speeds to improve the safety through the work site. Um, the other good use of LUM signs is where you might have part-time traffic use of the emergency stopping lane, which Morris mentioned before. So if that's a part-time use, then being able to indicate to drivers when the emergency stopping lane is open to traffic and when it's not um, uh, can be useful. Traveller information. So a managed freeway also um, uses traveller information to advise drivers what's happening and that can uh, that strategy can also include pre-trip information so that drivers prior to departure can listen to the radio or log into the internet or watch TV um, in order to get um, information about how the freeway is operating. The on-road information can be uh, provided to drivers on the main line of the freeway or on the arterial roads leading to the freeway and preferably both. So the mainline traveller information uh, is usually done by a variable message sign such as this uh, and in this particular case this sign is actually supporting what is happening further downstream where there's a lane closure of the right hand lane. Assuming the variable message signs are there they can also be useful if there's no incident or nothing particular to tell drivers about they can tell drivers uh, about travel times to various destinations so usually up to three destinations uh, can be displayed on the sign and uh, they can also be color coded um, green indicating that it's fairly good conditions yellow a, a little bit more uh, medium and red is, is heavier traffic conditions so as well as the travel time which is probably uh, useful for uh, frequent drivers of the freeway who have some idea of what the time should be. Um, the colour can be very useful for the um, infrequent user of the freeway. So arterial travel information uh, can also be provided. So on the arterial roads before you actually turn onto the entry ramps, either the left turn or the right turn, getting onto the freeway, and at other further advanced decision points um, leading to the entry ramps where people have got um, an alternative route that they could follow. And again, these signs um, can show the travel time to various destinations, um, 10 minutes to South Gippsland Freeway, 16 minutes to Clyde Road, and the conditions light, medium or heavy. So these are the, um, the, the traditional arrangements, light, medium, heavy or closed if necessary um, and that's all integrated onto these signs on the arterial roads. Um, sometimes we also um, show other um, options such as major delays or seek alternate route. 
and to work out when do we show these different conditions, light, medium, heavy, major delays or seek alt route, um, generally that's done by uh, looking at the ratio of the estimated travel time, which is what the system is predicting the travel time is, compared to the nominal travel time, which is the travel time at the speed limit. And they're the, the range of ratios that you would use to, um, to indicate the different conditions. So here's another example of uh, LUM signs over a freeway. We've got four lanes here. Um, the right-hand lane is closed somewhere ahead, so this uh, arrow is indicating that travel, traffic should merge to the left. And most of it has. Hopefully this guy here will eventually um, get out of that lane before he gets to the next gantry with the red cross. And this also shows uh, an example of how variable message signs can be used, both with words and with symbols. Um, but although this is a picture of a real site, um, this is probably not ideal. It would be much better if we can separate the LUM signs and the variable message signs so they're on separate gantries because um, there's a lot of information there and if there's uh, something happening, uh, it's very difficult for drivers to actually absorb all the information on the variable message sign and on the LUM signs um, in the one place. So preferably that uh, they should be separated. It's also preferable to avoid having electronic signs, whether VMS or LUMS, um, and static direction signs on the same gantry. But we often have to make compromises, and it's probably a better compromise to actually have um, the static signs and electronic signs on the same gantry, rather than having two sets of electronic signs on the one gantry. So, this brings us to uh, the, the end, really, and just to summarise, uh, manage motorways aim to keep freeways operating safely and efficiently by providing coordinated ramp signals which minimise the chances of flow breakdown and therefore they maximise the throughput and try to keep um, operating speeds reasonably high. Um, managing incidents to minimise their, their traffic impact, providing real-time traveller information, providing robust data collection and monitoring systems and integrating all of those tools into a user-friendly system so that a traffic management centre can um, truly manage the freeway as effectively as possible. Great, David. Um, Thank you so for that. That's as much as we can fit into uh, 40 minutes. Um, there are further two-day workshops um, that, um, that ARB organisers and Morris and I present at, uh, which will cover these uh, uh, issues in much further detail. Um, and those workshops are planned for Adelaide in August, Brisbane in November, um, and Melbourne, Sydney and Auckland sometime in the future. Um, so if you are interested in attending any of those workshops, please uh, register your interest, um, either by email um, or through the ARRB website. Thanks so much for that, David. Thank you, David and Morris, for okay. your presentation. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to unmute Kathy Boddington from ARB's Perth office and also Paul Bennett from ARB's Melbourne office just to give them an opportunity to um, perhaps comment on, on some of your slides or, or contribute. How are you going today, Kathy? Hi, yes, I'm good, thank you. Um, yeah, and I suppose I, I'd just like to um, sort of emphasise the, the strong commitment across Australia to the, the wider rollout of um, managed freeways across the network. I think that's both at the state level, and obviously there's been some federal funding commitments, um, and there are projects across the states in various stages of implementation. Um, as this point I want to make really is that there's um, you know, slightly different approaches and applications of this managed freeways toolkit um, across those states, um, but really the, the fundamental principles um, that have been discussed today and can be expanded on in our um, workshop series are, are really the same and uh, it's the sort of traffic theory um, behind um, the application of managed freeways that's, that's really most important um, to understand you know, how and why these tools can better help us manage um, traffic on our network. Um, yeah, and I also wanted to emphasize there's a lot of um, work um, being done by Austrade within their research program that's of relevance to this. Um, including updating the guides, which I think um, Paul might be able to expand on a bit more. Yep. Do you want me to take over? If you're there for, yeah, yeah, if you perhaps do you want to give a bit of background on a couple of projects that you've um, been working on. Uh, 
Okay. Well, first, um, thanks, Morris and David, for that presentation. Uh, yeah, I've worked on a couple of Austroads projects. Um, the first of those has been um, the formulation of harmonised guide content on managed motorways uh, for Australia and New Zealand. Um, we're mostly adopting the Vic Roads guidelines, but um, should, we hope this will be published later in the year. Uh, so pro providing guidance for all uh, state road authorities. Uh, and the second one is looking at the interface of managed motorways with arterial roads, um, on, on ramps and off ramps, uh, in the motorways, the motorway to motorway interchanges, um, and looking at improving operational efficiencies of those interfaces, efficiencies of the two interfaces, and the time of um, So that one should also hopefully be published later in the year, Jules. Good, thanks Paul. Um, there's a few questions that um, people have raised uh, um, here which we might um, try to, to look at. Um, the first one from Kamal um, is about slide 31. Let's go back to uh, this one. So Kamal's question is about what might have actually be causing um, the flow breakdown in the managed conditions, so I think he's probably talking about this little loop here, is that right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, you can answer that because I've got no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Kamal, thanks for that. Um, there's probably a few things that could have caused this sort of uh, uh, situation. One could be just the spike in heavy uh, or high density traffic, which happens to be in the main line at that point with uh, you know, bunching of traffic. It could be a reaction to uh, somebody braking suddenly, or it could be somebody uh, not concentrating on the driving task and rubber necking, looking at something perhaps on the opposite carriageway or something of that nature. There's probably a few uh, possible reasons for, for that sort of um, you know, breakout of, uh, of flow data which starts to um, trigger flow breakdown. But Whatever the cause, I suppose the important thing to say is that um, to, to, to be able to manage this sort of thing, it's important to have a, a uh, ramp metering system which can recognise the, the symptoms of what's going on and then can uh, take uh, swift action to, uh, to bring the flow back under control. So, um, so that's the important thing, whatever the, whatever the cause. I think that it's the... It's, uh, it's having a system that can um, be sensitive enough to, uh, to uh, rectify the situation, which is the important thing. Yep, cool. So any, any sort of um, turbulence you know, can cause a, a little bit of flow breakdown, but if the coordinated ramp signals can react to that, then hopefully it brings it back into, um, into the optimum area. So there's another question here from... Um, uh, from Menov. Menov, about oh. how can we manage the ramp queue um, if there are traffic signals nearby, and um, certainly we go into that quite a lot in the uh, in the workshop. Um, but this is this raises the very interesting point about how do we manage the motorway compared to the um, the freeways that uh, have interchanges with the motorway, and. Um, and basically, you know, the policy decision needs to be to keep the motorway operating as efficiently as possible, um, a, a, as much as you possibly can, which might mean that occasionally um, the queues on the, um, on the entry ramp actually queue back to the traffic signals uh, on the arterial road. And of course there are various things that you can do geometrically and operationally to try and minimise that. Um, but, uh, that, that's probably one of the key issues in implementing managed motorways. I think ideally um, the ramp length should be designed to provide sufficient storage so that um, the queues don't go back to the intersection. Um, but uh, in some cases, uh, like realistically, it may not be feasible at some locations um, because of downstream conditions. Uh, in some locations, it may be possible to provide some storage on the arterial road uh, at the interse intersection, uh, and in other locations, um, it might 
mean that you need to provide additional storage at other ramps upstream, upstream to compensate for the lack of storage at, at one particular ramp. Um, I think integration with the uh, intersection signals is important uh, so that uh, you know, appropriate actions can be taken if, um, if issues arise. Cool. Um, there's another question here um, about um, the, the, the graph of probability. Um, so the question is my comment, but uh, we agree with the comment, <laughs> which is where's the graph of probability? Uh, this one. Yeah, that's, that's a really good way to think about the um, the likelihood of flow breakdown is that it is probabilistic. You know, it, you, there isn't a magical number at which it's going to happen, and some days it might happen at 2,000 vehicles per hour per lane, and some days it might happen at, at only 1,500. So uh, that probabilistic way of thinking about it is, is good. Um, there was also a question about um, should LUMS be allowed to fully replace conventional um, traffic management signs? Um, my answer would be not fully. Um, whereas LUMS are a very good way of um, ensuring that we can uh, implement um, lane closures very quickly. Um, it is all dependent on driver um, uh, compliance and whereas driver compliance with red lights tends to be pretty good, red traffic lights, um, driver compliance with a red cross over a lane doesn't seem to be quite as good. So I wouldn't actually rely on an overhead red cross entirely to protect um, workers downstream um, and certainly if the lane closure is going to be implemented for some period of time then I think it's a good idea to have um, cones and bollards and um, truck mounted attenuators and uh, whatever else necessary to actually enforce the lane closure. But um, the LUM signs certainly help a lot. What other questions have we got there? So there's a question here from Janet Dobbs about whether where there's examples of motorway principles have been applied to urban arterials in an attempt to control flow through a capacity bottleneck like a bridge. Uh, well, Janet, I'm not aware uh, of whether this has been done much um, in the in the traffic signal operations space, but I think we have learned quite a lot from uh, the operation of uh, of um, a good algorithm for freeway management that feedback from what's going on downstream could well be applied to uh, traffic signals operations as well and this might be an area where um, further uh, investigational research could be considered. Mm. Well, I think the idea of um, gating traffic flow at traffic signals on arterial roads um, uh, is not done very often but it's certainly you know considered and uh, um, that is one way of, uh, of managing the arterial roads. What else have we got so here? Hugh Dixon asks uh, regarding ramp metering, how accurately or well or easily can the vehicle storage required be estimated? Well the, the sort of ramp uh, storage um, which is considered desirable uh, in most states I think now as well as uh, what's being included in the new Osroads um, report that Paul talked about was uh, to provide storage for a minimum of four minutes storage and this is fairly easily calculated from fairly simple uh, formulas. Um, we can provide further information on that uh, if you would like, to, like it to be sent. But uh, this is an area where quite a bit of time is spent in the two-day uh, managed motorway workshop where we go through not only the principles of ramp signal design, both from a storage and capacity point of view and uh, uh, geometrics of ramps, um, but also uh, have some practical exercises. Okay, I'd like to jump to the question um, Joe Whistle is asking about um, the experience of motorists' ob observance of LUMS and their compliance. Um, in Melbourne, I have to say that I don't think the compliance with the Red Cross is particularly good. And I think that's possibly because there are some locations in Melbourne where the Red Cross is used um, on a fairly regular basis 
but it's hard for the drivers to see why it's there. Um, I'm hoping that in other states, if they implement this type of these types of LUM signs, um, that um, they're used with more discretion and therefore they get the trust of the public. Um, but for some reason in Melbourne, the compliance, I mean, it's reasonable, but it's certainly n nowhere near 100%. I don't think that there's any particular um, experiments or, or data that's been collected on compliance. Um, David, can I just ask, what, um, is there um, an enforcement regime that's accompanied the implementation of LUMS in Victoria? Uh, not really. I think that the police find it very difficult to find somewhere to prop to actually, you know, um, enforce um, the signals. So there's not a huge amount of enforcement, no. Okay. That could help. Yes, I, I don't know the situation in, in other states either. Maybe David Giles, if you could put a comment in the in the, in the questions space uh, and make some observations from Queensland's perspective, it might be helpful. <laughs> oh, Tony's put a comment there which uh, I'm hoping everybody can read. No, they can't see it. Oh, they can't. No. Should we read that? Can we turn that one? Or should we read this one? Yeah, just read that out. Yeah, Tony Newen uh, from. Uh, from uh, Oh, yes, presumably, uh, has, has put in a comment here that for Sydney motorways, an increasing behavioural trend that, that he, he has started to hear about more often are motorists, particularly heavy vehicle drivers, tend to tailgate when traffic is flowing, let alone at congested periods. My question relating to this would be, are there any managed motorway techniques and or technologies to address this issue? education, awareness campaigns and enforcement seems insufficient to provide the action necessary. This driving behaviour may be a contributing factor to the six times likelihood of incidents on motorways. There are, are there any future plans in designing motor, managed motorway technology that can detect such driving behaviour and provide the appropriate warnings? So it's tailgating. Mm. I don't think we're there yet. No, the <laughs> tailgating, particularly by uh, trucks, uh, can be um, a concern. Um, in um, Melbourne, there's uh, some um, banning of trucks from from the fast lane on on some freeways. Um, so that might be something that could could be considered. I know in uh, some overseas jurisdictions there's um, restrictions on how close um, vehicles can follow and trucks particularly, uh, but I'm not aware of anything being considered in that in that way uh, in Australia. This is perhaps an area where um, cooperative ITS will play a, a greater role, and we need to kind of better understand how that will um, integrate or work with our managed freeway systems to um, to achieve the best outcome. Yes. Um, we'll jump back to a question, another question from Manoj about um, uh, different speed limits in different lanes. Um, I didn't say this during this presentation, but um, it's, it's uh, um, almost an unwritten rule that um, you have to have the same speed limit on all signs on the one gantry. So all lanes operate with the same speed limit, and that's basically because the road rules say that a speed limit applies to a length of road. Um, there's nothing in the road rules that says a speed limit can apply to a particular lane, um, even though a sign over a lane applies to that lane. Um, but also, you wouldn't want to have different speed limits on different lanes um, because um, you just don't want to have that differential in speed um, between adjacent traffic. So one of the um, inbuilt rules within the LUM signs is that um, if a speed limit is uh, displayed on a gantry, then all of the lanes have the same speed limit. Well, there's a question here from Ian Esparta. Can you comment on the management of freeways under inclement weather? 
Uh, inclement weather certainly can uh, affect uh, the traffic flow. Um, ma I think managing the freeway um, using occupancy as um, some ramp signaling systems do uh, does uh, improve the, the way uh, flow can be managed because occupancy is much more stable um, under um, a range of different uh, conditions including inclement weather as well as different uh, lighting conditions and, and vehicle mix, whereas using flow uh, to manage the, uh, the main line is, uh, is not as uh, reliable as it can vary, vary a lot more. Okay, another question here from Kamal about um, automatic incident detection. Um, I did mention it on, in passing through, but um, uh, but there's a, a lot of work and probably a lot more potential work in improving um, automatic incident detection systems. But at the moment, um, with um, with detectors at say 500 metre spacings on an urban freeway, if you can get a reasonable um, uh, detection algorithm. Um, it will have some false alarms and there will be some occasions, particularly in light traffic conditions, where it doesn't detect uh, a broken down car or some sort of incident. But any major disruption, um, it will uh, raise alerts and uh, the traffic management centre staff can then look at closed circuit TV and verify what the incident is and decide what action to take. So there are systems there. Uh, Melbourne has got um, a, a, an automatic incident detection system on most of our inner, uh, inner urban freeways. But um, we think that probably there's, um, there's more improvements that can be made in those algorithms to, uh, to make them more accurate. Uh, David Giles has, uh, from TMO has provided some comment on enforcement of LUMS in uh, Brisbane and he has indicated there that there's no enforcement of loan closures there. Thanks for that, David. Uh, David and Morris. Sorry, just me again. Um, it looks like we're yes, running short of time, so we might just take one more question and then we'll wrap up for today. And um, ladies and gentlemen, as I, as I said earlier on, if we haven't been able to get to your question today, we'll certainly be following up after the presentation and you're most welcome to contact Morris or David at any time also. So I'll hand over to the presenters for one more question and then we'll um, uh, say our goodbyes, I think. Thanks. Okay, we're just looking through the questions to work out if there's another one we can answer. Um, different speed limits. Uh, someone's asked about secondary road crash records. Um, I'm not sure that crash records are, are very good at indicating whether they're as a result of some other um, previous um, disruption on the freeway, but certainly that figure that we that we did in the poll question about um, uh, crashes are six times more likely to happen under congested conditions than under um, free flowing conditions. So even though congested conditions might have um, uh, slower traffic speeds, um, uh, they still can have you know more crashes in those conditions simply because of the disruption. Um, and the, the changing traffic conditions as a shockwave goes through, and people speed up and then they slow down. So, um, so I think it's um, intuitive that, um, that if there is some disruption on the freeway and there's congestion, that it's quite more likely that there will be secondary crashes uh, as a result. I think that means we're just about done. I think so. Okay. If there's any other questions that we haven't answered, we'll try and answer them um, through email. Thank you very much, Morris and David, for joining us today. And a big thank you also to Cathy Boddington and Paul Bennett, who have also joined in the discussion today. Uh, if there's any questions we haven't been able to answer today, please don't hesitate to email them through to our presenters. Um, David or Morris, maybe you could put it back to the slide with uh, your contact details there. And um, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, we will be sending everyone that's joined us today a copy of the presentation materials as well as... 
as well as a link to the recording of the webinar so you can view that back at a later date. Alrighty, thank you everyone for joining us today and hope you can join us for some future ARB webinars. Thank you. <laughs>